I want to welcome everyone to the 4T virtual conference session with Katherine Pfeiffer and Sister Rebecca Marendorf. My name is Leah Askew and I will be your session moderator. I am a newly graduated elementary teacher from the Master's in Certification Program at the University of Michigan. Please note that if you are in a session for CEUs, make sure you've logged in with your full name, first and last, and if you haven't, please log out and go ahead and log back in the session with your full name. The 4T conference would like to thank its partner this year, Oakland Schools in Michigan. In addition, we thank Wix, Cherry Tree Hill Publishing, VoiceThread, Digo, and Globster for providing the door prizes this year. A couple of reminders, again, if you are applying for CEUs, please go ahead and log in the session with your full name and stay for the entire session. If you're not logged in with your full name, you can go ahead and log out and log back in with your full name. If you need more information on how to apply for CEUs, I'm going to post a link in the chat right now. You can get more information at the virtual conference website. So that link is posted. Again, I'm going to go over a few of the tools that we'll be using tonight. So over on this slide, if you could go ahead and click the magic wand tool and show us where you are located tonight. It's great to have so many participants joining us tonight. Now I'm going to introduce our presenters. And at the end of our presentation, we will have an evaluation, if you could please fill that out at the end. So this presentation is on collaborative technology in the classroom. And our presenters tonight are Katherine Pfeiffer and Sister Rebecca Marendorf. Katherine currently works as a teacher consultant for the Intergalactic Mobile Learning Center, IMLC, at the University of Michigan. She has a bachelor's degree in business from Clear University and a master's in education from the University of Michigan. She has always had a passion for computers, gadgets, and technology. When it came time to start working in the classroom, she wanted to find ways to integrate technology into the teaching and learning experience. It is a passion for her and fortunately has turned into a job which she loves. She is currently focused on integrating collaborative tablet technologies in K-12 classrooms with her work at the University of Michigan. Sister Rebecca is a member of the Servants of God's Love, a religious order based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She has a bachelor's in biology from the Franciscan University of Steubenville and a master's in educational studies from the University of Michigan. She is, she is certified at both the elementary and secondary levels in Montessori education. She taught at Christian Montessori School of Ann Arbor for five years and now teaches middle school science at St. Francis of Assisi School in Ann Arbor. She teaches project-based inquiry science to seventh and eighth graders and they do science rather than just learn about science. In addition, this year she has partnered with the University of Michigan to provide the 7th and 8th graders with Google Nexus tablets. The students use the tablets in a variety of ways in all their classes. The tablets are especially useful in encouraging collaborative learning. The students work together on educational applications that have been designed by University of Michigan students. They use these experiences to create meaning together. Thank you again for joining us, and now I'm going to hand it off to our presenters. Thank you for that wonderful welcome, and thank you all for joining Rebecca and I this evening, and we look forward to sharing our experiences with you. As um, we had uh, prepared for this evening, we started talking a lot about um, this past year, and it's so amazing that this time has uh, come about, I can't believe we're wrapping up the school year. Um, it seems like yesterday that we were just talking last August about how to bring uh, iPads into the classroom. And um, actually, I need um, to 
the controls to be able to move the slides. So if you can um, go ahead and move me to the next slide, please. Um, and so uh, I started thinking about all the different words that we use when uh, we uh, talk about technology in the classroom. And so I thought, uh, you know, here are a bunch of words that we use and uh, uh, desktops were like the first computing devices that we had in the classroom. Um, if we were lucky, we had them in the classroom and not in a lab somewhere. And so <laughs> now we have all these different types of technologies available to us. We have laptops, we have tablets, we have smartphones, smart cards, um, we have iPads, and it seems to be a growing, growing uh, useful sources of technology. Are there any other types of technologies that you can see um, that you can add to the list? You can type them into the chat room um, that uh, we have. I, I, um, I, I couldn't think of any more, but if you can add to the list, I would love to know what else you might be using in the classroom that I had I have on the list. Um, and if you can take your, your wand tool and mark the, the what you are using in the classroom currently, I'd like to know of our of our participants what you're using in your classroom. If you're using the iPads, tablets, or laptops. Fantastic. Okay, so we have great. We have a great. Um, uh, do, do we have anyone using the um, bring, bring your own devices? Any students that are bringing their own to class? Okay, good. Oh, good. We have one person. That's fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm going to have uh, uh, Rebecca talk a little bit about. Oh, live scribe pens. Oh, I'd like to hear more about that. Perhaps at the end. I'm going to get back with you, Heather. We're going to take a note of that. Um, I'm going to have uh, Rebecca talk a little bit about how this all started back in August. Okay, so we had some money, uh, not a lot of money, but some money that we needed to spend on technology in our school. And so I sent an email to Catherine, my techie friend, um, and said, you know, should we buy you know, 12 iPads or six iPads or whatever. I can't even remember how many we were thinking about. Of course, she was very excited about that and, you know, shot an email back to me about all the things I should be considering about that, which, of course, is a huge long list. And I took to my principal and basically the two of us looked at each other and said, we can't even think about this. School's going to start in a week. And, you know, buying iPads is one thing, but thinking about how are we going to have the wireless access, the tech support, what kind of apps are we going to buy? What apps are free? How is this really going to be good for the classroom? How is it going to enhance our curriculum? How are we going to teach the teachers how to use them so that they're not just, um, you know, shelved somewhere? And how are we going to teach the students to use them so that they, you know, are very meaningful for them? And it was just a, an overwhelming list and we couldn't handle it. And we said, we'll, we'll talk about this again in October. And then that was kind of the end of our iPad discussion. Um, and then Catherine and I ended up you know, with a whole other technology uh, path at that point in October um, through the, the goodness of the University of Michigan. And that's where we are today. Yeah. So um, that comes into where we, uh, the question is, let's get iPads. It's a, it's a fabulous program. A lot of people think, all right, we want to enhance our educational technology program at our school. And iPads are very accessible. Everyone knows about them. A lot of people know how to use them. And so a lot of things that happen um, that people go out and buy a class set or a, 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 a group of iPads to be used, they get a cart and then they get stuck because they're really not sure how to proceed. And so this is coming from my experience working with Rebecca, um, you know, some of the questions that, that I actually sent her were, um, in, and I also added to this, you know, first to ask, you know, how do you plan on using this technology? And uh, how, do, how do you, um, how it will enhance learning in your classroom? And um, this is really important. Um, oh, you can go on to the next one now. Um, so before you go forward to buying technology, you want to find out um, 
how, in answer to these questions, how will you incorporate this technology into your instruction and into your curriculum, um, which is pretty tricky you, because it's not just a matter of having the, the tablets as um, we, a lot of people have already figured out. Um, it's not just about having um, really cool apps, but it's about how do I use this effectively? What will you get and why? This is a really, really powerful question. Is it getting an iPad versus an Android tablet? Um, what's the cost of each of these devices? Uh, and the, the iPads are pretty expensive. And if you look at the differences between iPads or Android tablets, there's quite a difference in price. And if you find out what works best in your system, you may be surprised that one may be better than the other. But you have to take time to look at the differences. So you have to look at the cost, the versatility, and the accessibility of each of these products. But what comes down to it is money a lot of times. Because the money is who, who's buying this? Are students buying this or the school buying it? How much will it cost? And the cost goes beyond just the product itself. You know, what support is required? Who will provide that support? You know, you know, the replacement cost on top of buying apps and who's going to provide the support to the Wi-Fi and the support in general just to help teach your teachers how to use the program and integrate it into their curriculum. These are really big things that a lot of people um, don't really think about initially when they thought, oh, I really want an iPad in my classroom. And maybe you have thought about that, and that is a fantastic first step. So that, that's what um, one of the wonderful things. And, what a, one big answer I have for you about all of these questions is to be purposeful and ask, ask a lot of questions and take the time to answer them. And depending on each situation, a class, if, whether you're buying a class set or one-to-one, -one, um, that may be the best scenario for your school and, and it's for each school to decide. We started out with a class set for uh, St. Francis. And we moved to a one-to-one, -one, which, which showed us and taught us a lot of lessons about how the program worked and how students responded to, to having shared tablets versus having their own. So there's a lot that we learned from that in itself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the program that we, um, that we have developed. We actually have a, a suite of programs that are developed at University of Michigan by University of Michigan students at the School of Engineering, and it's called My Desk. And this is the creator of My Desk, it's Elliot, uh, Professor Elliot Soloway, and he's created this with the idea that um, he wanted to create educational apps that were collaborative. And so My Desk is a suite of apps available for mobile devices. The apps, which are called We Write, we KWL, we map, and we sketch are uploaded onto each mobile device. A student can move back and forth between my desk, which contains the lesson, uh, the learning apps, and media resources like websites, PDFs, and videos, which are both inside the classroom and outside the classroom, which can be used both inside the classroom and outside the classroom as the student works through lessons contained in my desk. What is unique about these apps is the collaboration functionality. When an internet connection is available, Wi-Fi or cellular, a student can initiate a new collaborative session or join an existing session. For example, if a student is working on a concept map in WeMap, another student may join that session and both students will be able to view the same concept map and both will be able to make changes to that same concept map concurrently. There are no limits to the number of students that can participate or join collaborative sessions. All who participate will be able to view, add, modify, and delete synchronously and simultaneously. If students who are using an app that is collaborified are seated together in the same room, they can chat while working collaboratively. However, if the students are not physically together, for example, each student is, 
is at her, his or her own home, they can still link a collaborative session given they both have access to the internet and Wi-Fi. This creates opportunity for a different type of learning with technology. Students are building knowledge together. They are creating concept maps, animated illustrations, KWL charts, and project boards together. They are sharing information about what they know, bringing their prior, no prior knowledge quite literally to the table, drawing it out, making adjustments and corrections within their, within their team. So one of my primary concerns when I thought about, you know, incorporating mobile technology into the classroom was encouraging students to stare by themselves into their devices in a similar way to what they do when they're walking down the street or they're home at their living room or they're in their bedrooms or whatever. And it's a very isolating thing. And that was the last thing that I wanted in my classroom uh, because I really believe that they learn by talking to each other, um, having discussions as a large group or a small group or as a partner. And the way that this My Desk has been created um, not only allows them, but um, makes them collaborate together. So they, they have to have conversations while they are, you know, using the touch screen, using their stylus or whatever to, you know, put things onto the screen, but they're also making meaning by their conversation. Um. So, as we've explored other educational technologies, we discovered that not all educational technology is created equal. Um, we, we, uh, we really value collaboration. And it, here you can see this educational technology. There, this is a school which says students, um, uh, there, are, there are some schools who believe that children learn best by plugging them into computers and simply allowing the computer to guide them through the instruction. While the students test well following their daily dose of instruction in front of the computer, we believe students learn best when interacting with other students and with other students and teachers. In fact, when we looked at this initially, we thought we, we as adults really hate sitting in this kind of situation as it working. We really don't like sitting in cubicles. Why would we expose our students to this as well? And then I, I giggled when I thought I found this almost days after experiencing that uh, <laughs> that picture saying, uh, here are teachers that they pride themselves in preparing uh, students for the future, uh, thinking that uh, we're, we're putting them in cubicles to learn in school and we're going to put them in cubicles uh, as adults. But literally, um, we we're tearing down cubicles in the workspace. So I think we should be doing the same and continuing collaboration in the uh, school as well. So going back to the app, um, as I started exploring other apps, uh, almost 75% uh, of the apps that I looked at were drill. They were either like uh, flashcards or um, read and write. They were all they were all drill, um, and they weren't they were not um, constructive or knowledge based. They were all just about getting getting the students to respond to a, a stimulus. And so um, coming back to what we do, this is what collaborative technology looks like. Here are students, they are working on projects, um, project-based science, which works well with what we're doing in collaboration in school. And you can see that the students are um, looking at the science books and they're creating, they're creating a Wii map together, uh, the concept maps together. And what I will say is these mobile devices do not take the place of doing science. You can notice um, in my classroom they have um, those beautiful lab tables. I don't know if you can see them very well in the pictures, but um, they are in groups of four at a lab table and there's a sink in the middle of each table. And we are doing science uh, a lot of the time. What these pictures are specifically are when they had to read something out of the textbook and make meaning of the information. So what this is replacing is you know, read this and then answer the questions at the end of the chapter. This is saying, okay, there's 
a lot of information here in this chapter that you have to read and you have to make sense of. So with the three other people in your group, input this information into your tablet in a way that makes sense to you with color, with different shapes, with lines, with arrows, uh, double-headed arrows. Um, you can move things around after discussion if it makes more sense to put it somewhere else. Um, so they basically can manipulate the information until um, what they've read is more firmly implanted into their minds because they've actually had to do something with it. So when, when we started talking of uh, in the initial phases of introducing uh, the tablet program at St. Francis, we found out that Sister Rebecca had the project-based PBIS, or project-based inquiry science program, about, from It's About Time, uh, at her, in her, being used in her classroom, which is, was the perfect match for what we are doing in, the, in our collaborative programs. In fact, there were conversations in the past about coming together and joining the two pro products, which I had not known about beforehand. So here we are, um, kind of making a full circle. Um, and when, when we brought this idea of um, collaboration, uh, collaborative technology into the science program, it, it really made sense. The students took to it very well and going through the processes, it, it just, everything felt right. And the students always responded well. Um, the, 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 pro the programs in the science book, the questions were leading it, uh, to creating uh, great collaborative, pro uh, collaborative discussions that, and that helps um, when you have a, a, the curriculum that helps match up with the, with the tablet programs as well. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm going to pass this off um, and talk, we're going to talk a little bit, Rebecca, Rebecca's going to talk about um, how she would do a lesson plan. She just did this one last week. Um, and I also want to talk about, just make a note, this is, we don't, the, the tablet is not a toy and the students don't treat it as one either. It's a very, they're very responsible and they treat it uh, with great respect and it, it is very used as a tool in the classroom. And go ahead and take it away. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into how things work uh, for me. Um, this is, uh, this was called, we're learning about water quality indicators in this particular unit. So this is the introduction to the second chapter. And this is what I have up on the screen as students enter. I give students two to three to five minutes uh, when they come into class to kind of get settled, find a place for all of their things, and do these tasks that are on the board. So they need to get textbooks, and they need to check for internet connectivity. I occasionally have trouble where one or two of them can't access the wireless, and so we have to get passwords for them. Um, and then, of course, occasionally there are two or three or four of them who uh, have managed to leave their tablet somewhere else, um, usually at home. So I want to know that right away so that when we start using the technology, I know who doesn't have internet and who does not have a tablet so I can keep, be keeping track of, I can either troubleshoot for them or I can keep track of who's um, able to participate more or less for the day. I also say, so is your tablet cover because this is not an invitation then to do other things with the tablet. So then they, we always start class in a circle, and so that's the final instruction. Once we get started, um, I'll tell them what our agenda is, and we just have a variety of things going on. Um, two of these things, we're actually using the tablet. So the first thing is just an introduction about uh, water quality and how, how do you know water is bad? So I ask them, you know, show them this sign and some other signs as well, you know. What do you think is happening to the water? Why do you think these signs are up? And then kind of solicited different ideas. Oh, yeah, we weren't able to swim one time. Or we weren't able to drink the water. We got sick or whatever. Just to give them an introduction or get their minds thinking about water quality. Um, I then had four different people come up and talk about water quality specifically. So again, we're just laying the, the foundation for what is your knowledge already about water quality um, and where do we need to go here uh, from here to build on that. Okay, and I think 
here we're just talking about more water quality tests. Um, again, soliciting information and what they know already about water quality testing because they've, they've done testing before um, we went up to Traverse City and so I want to see what they remember from that when we were on Lake Michigan earlier. All right, so this is the first part of the class. This is probably 10, 15 minutes into class. And also remember this is eight months into the school year. So at this point they really know how to use the tablets and they know how to use the My Desk Suite and they know what a project board is. So we've been using a project board for the entire school year and I can, I put very explicit instructions on the screen but I'm also assuming that they know that they're opening My Desk um, and they know how to create a session. So in this particular instruction, each um, seat number at the table, at the tables is numbered. So each table or each group has a person number four. And so they're just opening a file that already exists in their tablet. And then where it says select the red square and create a session, it just means um, make it collaborative, basically so that other people can join the session. So that person creates a session, person number four, and then people one, two, and three join that session. The question that we're talking about today is how do you determine the water quality in a community? And then I just say you need to write everything you know um, in the K column, what do we know already or what do we think we know already? And then the I column is what do we need to inv investigate? And again, they're just writing questions, investigative questions that can guide our, the, really the rest of the unit um, and where we're going. They can't just say something like, you know, is the water quality bad? You know, they have to say, you know, how do we know it's bad or, you know, how do we test it? Those kind of things. So I'm giving you a little bit of instructions, but they really know what they're doing at this point. Here's an example of what it looks like. So this one is filled out, all five columns are filled out, but this is from a student's tablet and they were working together. So four different people have worked on this over a series of maybe three or four different sessions. So from the previous slide, you can tell that they were just working on the K and I column. This is a glorified KWL, for those of you who are familiar with that. So the K column, and the I column are the ones that they fill out first and then L and E are what are we learning and what is our evidence and then C is what does this mean for the big challenge. Those will come later in the unit. So this project board that we chose to show you, we've already done those things and just to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. So basically it is a way for the students to work together as a group to chronicle what they're learning. So the first thing is, hey, we know this stuff already, or at least we think we know this already. And then, well, we don't know this, so we need to ask questions about these things. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, I'll say, okay, it's time to go to the what are we learning, what is our evidence, and then finally, what does this mean for the big challenge? Okay. Um, we also uploaded what this used to look like for students, and I have to say it was pretty similar to pulling teeth for me to get them to actually write down these things. So this, in this particular example, this person wrote a fair amount, but I think if you were to type it and then compare it to this one, you'll notice that they actually have typed a lot more than they can hand write because I don't know if any of you are familiar with teaching middle school students, they really don't like to write at all. And so, they'll write the very least that they possibly can um, and still kind of get the assignment done. So I used to say things like you have to write at least two things in every column or something like that to get them to actually produce something and they hated it. I probably shouldn't say that very loudly because I know some of the authors of these textbooks but they, they really did hate it. So anyway, going back to something like this, where they can type, um, they can use their thumbs if they want, they can use a stylus. Um, and again, they're not even always capitalizing things or writing in full sentences. I do try to get them to write question marks at the end of the sentence, uh, question. But other than that, as long as they get the information in, we're good. Um, and they're pretty good at getting the information in because it's a lot more attractive to them to type on their tablet than to try to produce something that's handwritten. Okay, so the next part of the lesson, we're, we're just kind of moving through this. The project board took, I don't know, maybe five minutes. 
So that's not even the, the biggest part of the lesson. That's just, you know, let's, let's chronicle where we've been and where we need to go. And then the concept map is actually taking new information and trying to figure out what it means for them. So if you notice, I have a person number three creates the new we map this time. And you also notice that I have um, in red, I've written how to name the file. And it's a very similar name to what the previous one was. I like to have things um, very similar and very easy. So if I have to go back and find it, or if they have to go back and find it, everybody's named it practically the same thing. So in this case, I have two seventh grade classes, one we call 7-1 and one we call 7-2. And then the X represents the table letter. Every table has a letter. And then fertilizers, everybody names it fertilizers. So you could have 7-1-A fertilizers, 7-1-2, or no, sorry, 7-1-B fertilizers, 7-1-C fertilizers, et cetera. So then I can keep track of them and they can keep track of them. And then they have to create a session, and, and again, it says table X, but that's really just their table letter, so they know to write table A or table B. So then when I go to join sessions, or when other people go to join sessions, we know who it is, which uh, session we're joining. So if I want to check up on table E while I'm talking to table G, I'll just, in my tablet, I'll enter the session for table E. I can see what they're typing, and then I can simultaneously have a conversation with another table. All right, so these are their instructions for this concept map. Um, they're just supposed to read something in their textbook and make a concept map. And I, I gave them a little bit of directions. Sometimes I just say make a concept map of how this makes sense to you. And other times I, there are specific things that I really want them to pull out of the content. So this one, fertilizer is a little bit confusing because um, it, when it goes into the water, um, it produces a lot of plant growth, which I think most people would say, yay, that's good. Plant growth is good. Um, but it can be very detrimental to water quality. So, and yet in small amounts, it's okay. So I wanted them to pull out of their reading what's the, the effect of a little bit of fertilizer in the water and then what are the effects of a lot of fertilizer in the water. So those are their, their two main nodes. And from those nodes, I told them that they, there need to be some sort of chain of effects um, that happens from those causes. This slide was me taking a screenshot of something that I had started just in case they didn't understand at all what was going on. So basically if they didn't understand, hey, you need two nodes and, and then you're going to have different things coming off of them. I made this slide just in case, but neither class needed it. Um, they were able to figure out what was going on from the previous slide. So they probably spent 10 or 15 minutes creating these, and these are the kinds of things that they came up with. If you look at the top, um, you can just see their naming worked. This is class 7-2, table B, and they named it fertilizers. Um, and then you can see that they made this, this is table B, and they made a concept map after having read it. So they were able to say a little fertilizer, um, a little bit is good for the, this is one of the things that's hard for them is writing a small amount in these nodes. Um, so we're working on that still kind of summarizing because you can't always read all of it unless you tap on those nodes. But then they do know that it, it's good and it helps algae grow. Now the part on the right is a lot of fertilizer and that can cause problems. It can be too much algae. Um, oxygen levels are affected. Light can't get to the roots of other plants, um, too many nitrates in the water, et cetera. So again, they're just taking different things that they find in their reading and they're trying to figure out how they connect together. Here's another example of another group. This would be table C. Um, and what was really interesting, uh, I'd like to reiterate that these are groups of students that are working, three or four students at the same time creating the same that they're, they're all working uh, on the same product. Uh, and, and they sit around there, they, they, they agree on what, where you're gonna, they're going to start and where they're going to go. And they add stuff and then they ask questions and they say, well, I think that this should be pink or I think this should be green. Um, and they, we have such a polite group of seventh graders, <laughs> mostly. 
And, uh, and so sometimes they'll ask, can I move your note? I don't like the way this looks, or can I reword this? And, and there's a real conversation actually going on. I don't think, sometimes they say, I don't think this is correct. And um, let's look back in the book. And then they'll reread the book. Sometimes we're circulating in the classroom, and um, we'll notice that something just a little off, and we'll say, are you sure about this? And go, hmm, I wonder, and they'll go back in their book and, and check it out. And so there, it, it's a group of students collaboratively working, each on their own tablet, and they can see the changes happening in real time. So this is the part that happens, that this is the value to this particular app that you can't really get anywhere else. So they're creating this, and then they take it home. They've created something together as a group, and, uh, and it, it, it just isn't happening anywhere else, which is really cool. Um, Heather, yes, this is just for tablets. What it, currently, we have it um, for tablets and for iPads. They're working on finishing up uh, the iPad app as well. So think of it as like a Google Doc that is actually super handy for the classroom. That's an app. So they get to all work on it at the same time um, with different colors and all of that. Um, and they really enjoy it. Uh, and I think it, in terms of developmentally, it is an excellent way for them to take straight written text and make sense of it because they have to organize it and they have to figure out what follows after what um, and what are the causes and what are the effects and how do these things all connect together. And honestly, sometimes textbooks are not written that clearly, and they really need to do something like this to break it down so that they're actually understanding what is being said. I will, we'll talk more about that at the end, Heather. Thank you for asking. So now we've talked about KWL, we've talked about WeMap, and now we're going to talk about WeSketch. WeSketch is a, the illustration program, and what it does, it actually illustrates uh, and animates screen by screen whatever you would like your students to create. Now, this is a very powerful program, and it can create really, really wonderful stuff, depending on what you can do, uh, depending on what you would like to do. Uh, what I'm going to show you is something that Rebecca did in the science classroom, and it's uh, illustrating the blood flow. Um, and we're going to send you some links. We're going to send uh, first the link for uh, Abby's uh, blood flow, and it's going to take you uh, to an outside, and you might have, uh, sorry, to a link out, out of the web, out to the web, and you're going to have to resize it so you can see the whole picture. And when you do that, you're going to see the picture. Um, so just look at the first one right now. You're going to see uh, how Abby has, has um, illustrated the blood flow. And you can see how she's also <clears throat> labeled everything, the lungs, the right atrium, the left atrium the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and the tissues. And you see how she used blue to show the deoxygenated blood and red to show oxygenated blood and how it returns to the lungs and back to the heart. So think of your own seventh grade science class where you were given a photocopied copy, a kind of schematic of the heart, diagram of the heart and you were given a red colored pencil and a blue colored pencil and you had to draw the blood flow as it flows from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart and to the body. And all of those arrows were on one piece of paper. So it, it makes its point and it works well and you know that exact same picture was in your textbook so you could make, you know, you could draw the arrows exactly like your textbook did, or maybe you actually just had to color the arrows because they were already on the worksheet. So if you take that up a notch or maybe, you know, 100 notches, um, when they actually have to animate it, what they're doing is they're taking maybe 10 slides where they've, they've, photo, they've copied the, the heart and then they just, each slide has a different arrow and then they run them all together in this animation and so that it actually looks like it's flowing. And the amazing thing is when we were walking around and talking to them, they would play them for us and sometimes it would start going backwards or their arrows wouldn't quite match up or 
just all of a sudden the blood would jump from one place to another and they would have to go back and they'd have to edit it so that it actually looked like it was flowing, like Abby's did. So, and then it was changing color at appropriate places. So it just opens this whole new world and makes it so much more meaningful to them that yes, the blood actually flows and it's not just a static diagram. Thank you. Okay, I want you to go ahead and um, click on the second one. And this is uh, a, another St. Francis student doing the same one. Um, his name is Gregory. And, and this is uh, actually, he, he didn't do the label, but this is a pretty phenomenal, um, a pretty phenomenal thing for us as well uh, when, when the student uh, had created this. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Gregory? Right. And as you can see, both of them have kind of similar looking hearts. I think I had drawn a diagram of the heart on the board, so, or there was one in the book or something like that. So that's where they kind of got their, their base um, diagram from. But uh, in my first parent-teacher conference with, with Greg's mom, you know, she was nearly in tears from getting bad news from a variety of other teachers that day and basically just said, he just can't write. You know, he, he has a, what do we call it, um, 504 plan or MAT or something like that at the school, has difficulty writing, um, you know, expressing all the thoughts that are in his head on paper are very hard for him. But as you can see, he can animate blood flow through the heart. Like he gets it. He gets that there's two different colors and it flows from one place to another and where it flows and all of that. And really came up with a phenomenal diagram animation of the blood flow. Um, when I sent this blood flow um, sketch to his mother, she was nearly in tears again. She was so excited that he was that he did so well on it. She just wasn't used to getting um, she wasn't get used to getting such good news uh, about her son. If you click on the next link, um, you can actually have the sound. I I sat down with him afterwards and had him narrate what was happening. So go ahead and click on this link and listen to him telling you what's going on with his blood flow. Give me a thumbs up when you're finished. Finish. If you could somehow indicate by getting a thumbs up or something so that we know that you're done with the sound. Right. There we go. Green checks are great. Thanks, Beth. I do admit that I did sit down with him and we wrote out a script. So I asked him what was happening and he told me and I wrote it down and then he read it. So he wasn't just, you know, you know, able to narrate this you know, without practicing. He did practice it. But that is how we came up with the narration. It was his, it were, it was his words and his ideas. I just wrote them down so that he could read them back. So this is really important. As teachers, we talk a lot about creating differentiation. And this is another way we can do it. We can do it with uh, creating all these different ways for students to learn. And this is another really powerful way for students to learn, and here we're showing real examples uh, that is happening in this classroom. So we are really excited when this when this happens, and whether it's the my the the uh, the, the KWL the um, <laughs> <laughs> everything that we're doing, these examples are coming back, and it, it's through the collaboration and working together. So some of the important lessons we like to share, uh, things that have happened, we're going to just kind of go back and forth and talk a lot. I'm going to talk about what I came up with and then Rebecca is going to talk about how it came on her end with St. Francis. And so um, I talked about how we have to ask a lot of questions beforehand, right up front, you know, who will use these tablets and how the tablets will be used what types of software um, are going to be used, what type of apps. Um, again, we don't want the tablet for iPads just to be worksheets. They're pretty expensive worksheets. <laughs> um, 
And will students be allowed to take them home to finish homework? If this is not a one-to-one -one program, is that a possibility? Um, who creates rules uh, surrounding these uh, tablets? Uh, do we have contracts? And what does that look like? I think it's really important to go slowly. Um, we're always tempted to say, hooray, we've got iPads, hooray, we've got new technology. Um, everyone grab a tablet and let's go. And we wanted to do that, really, really wanted to do that. But <laughs> we slowed down, we put our brakes on, and we, we actually tried out a lesson plan. <laughs> actually, I'm going to let Rebecca take the, take the uh, microphone for a minute and talk about this. Um, it was a brilliant lesson plan, really, really was. And we, we gathered, we said, we're, we're going to try this. And we gathered um, all the adults we could, and we tried this out. So I had actually skipped this lesson at, in, in anticipation of getting the tablets. And so it involved sodium hydroxide and water and phenothaline and pipettes and many cups of liquid. And I thought we could um, trace our kind of fake disease and its travel through the classroom um, using the concept map um, and the arrows and the nodes being different people and who got who was sick and all of that. Well, what ended up happening was it was just a crazy mess because one thing we were really concerned about all the liquid uh, spilling on the tablets and so we had to figure out what to do with that. But even with adults, we just couldn't make it work. We couldn't, it was too complex, it was too confusing. It was one of those things where it's like, you know what, it would just be easier to use the whiteboard or it would be easier to use pen and paper. So we were so grateful that, for one thing, we didn't start with that kind of complex lesson and that we started with things that were much simpler, but that also that we had just tried it out and we realized this, this is not really going to help further any end. This is just going to make things worse. Um, so I think that that's really important, too, that, you know, we use technology when it's helpful, but the days when it's not helpful, we don't use it. Yeah, so we talked about, you know, practicing. Mm -hmm. and collaborate with our peers. You know, it's all right to say, hey, I'm, I have an idea. You want to try this out with me? And we've done that a lot. Right. And, and that has really helped make things work well. And sometimes we said, hey, that's not going to work. And that's okay. Actually, that's better to say, that's not going to work it, than to have, you know, something potentially it, disappointing happening. And so, all right, so some things that um, I have learned or that I've tried out that have worked well is we have something in our textbook called a mess about. Basically, if you're going to give students science materials and you need them to build something or figure things out, we would give them half an hour or so to mess about. So if we're making helicopters or cars or whatever it is, they get a chance to just use the materials and see how they work. So we translated that onto the tablets. For example, the first day that I wanted to use the Wii Sketch program, I made a very simple lesson plan where I said something like, I want you to make an animation of something we've discussed in science, either over the last three months if you're in seventh grade or the last year and a half if you're in eighth grade. And then they had the opportunity to use the entire class period to animate something, whether it was a car crashing into another car or um, the parachute falling or something like that, something they've done in class. And in that quote unquote mess about, they learned how to change the colors, how to change the line sizes, how to make text boxes, how to make squares, how to make circles, how to animate it. And I had to do very little teaching. When they got stuck, I was there to troubleshoot, but I did not have to say, okay, is everyone with me? Okay, this is how you draw a black square. Okay, everyone, pay attention. This is how you draw a red square because they're really not interested in that. They want to figure it out. So we let them figure it out. That also was applicable to any sort of new apps or a lot of new apps that we tried. For example, I wanted them to download a photo editor one time and so then their assignment that night, we downloaded it in class and then their assignment was take three pictures and write text over them. So they had to just figure out how the app worked. And again, I didn't have to teach them how to do it. I didn't have to keep their attention. They just figured it out. And there were a couple of them who, who couldn't quite figure it out and just helped them the next day. But they were familiar enough with the app that they said, oh yeah, that makes sense, no problem. The other thing that we did that was a little bit unique was at the very beginning of the partnership with the university, we had only 30 tablets. 
So we labeled them 1 through 30 and they stayed in my classroom. I had four classes and each person was numbered 1 through 30 and they essentially shared the tablet. So for each class period they each had their own but then they did not take that tablet out of the class with them. So the rules were pretty strict. You know, you only use them as you're told to use them and you have to label things as I tell you how to label them because otherwise we can't tell whose files are whose. So it got down even to the, the minutia of you can't change the desktop background or the wallpaper because why should somebody in seventh grade change it if someone in eighth grade can't um, and I didn't want them to spend a lot of time changing the background. So that had to stay the same and I always knew who it was if it was changed. So we were very stringent at the beginning and they loved them. They really, really loved the tablets anyway. And Professor Soloway was really excited about what we were doing and so they were able to get more tablets for us and then we continued the year starting in late January with an actual one-to-one -one program where the students were able to take them home. But at this point they realized that these were um, not simply a toy that they occasionally used for schoolwork but instead a tool that was its purpose was for schoolwork and maybe occasionally they could have fun on it. So we did let them download apps uh, for games and that kind of thing, but they couldn't be rated mature or I can't remember if we let them rate it teen or not. Anyway, we had a contract about, you know, what the ratings for video games were and, um, you know, they could change the wallpaper at that point um, and they can use it for fun stuff, but it was essentially a school tool and they were, you know, accountable for using it for school stuff. That was the number one priority. And they didn't feel entitled. It wasn't, you know, this is mine and I'm going to do what I want with it. Um, but no, this is something that, you know, the school has provided for us and we use for schoolwork. And we're so grateful that we actually get to play games on it as well. So they would come to me and say, is it okay if I download this or is it okay if I do this with it or whatever, which is a much better position to be in than me chasing them around and telling them, don't do that, don't do that. So anyway, so, th so that worked out really well. So we were really glad we kind of accidentally stumbled into that but that worked out really well. The other thing that I uh, really liked was you, you saw one of my lesson plans and one of my PowerPoints from later in the year but at the very beginning if I needed them all to do something or open something up or find a file or create a file, I would just take screenshots with my tablet and throw it up on a PowerPoint and say this is what I want you to select right now. Everybody do that. And then I knew where every, everybody knew what was expected of them and um, they could have a visual to kind of back up my instructions. We're excited now too that the, uh, we're, we're just on the cusp of the new technology for the Android tablets where you can actually connect your tablet to the computer and so pretty soon I should be able to project um, live whatever I'm doing on my tablet through my laptop into the projector. So that'll make things easier too because I won't have to do screenshots. We good? Yep. Okay. We have to. Yeah. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, so now <laughs> I'm a teacher. Do I have to look at all these tablets? Do I can grade assignments? And until about two weeks ago, Rebecca was doing just that. And thanks to the magnificent work of um, I have to remind you all that the student these are these are student built apps. So students from the University of Michigan build these. And so they spent the entire last semester creating this teacher portal so that now all of the tablets that uh, students in uh, Rebecca's class, classes, now go to this portal so that um, they all sync and everything just lives in the cloud. And so this is what the, the front screen looks like. I'm just going to go through this real quick so you know that you don't have to collect tablets and check them off. They you can actually just go and see that the students have actually completed the work and say, did they understand what I wanted them to understand? And sure enough, they do or they didn't. And then um, eventually this, is, this will get a little bit more sophisticated. This is the first version of this. So um, we're really impressed with these, our students over at the University of Michigan uh, writing these. They are mostly juniors and seniors. They're ready to graduate and go on to great wonderful things. And so it's very exciting to see this happening and every time we have something, but this is wonderful, every time we have something we like different, we say, um, can you please change this or we would really like it if it worked this way. And that's actually some, a part of the partnership 
that um, we've created. Uh, so they provided these tablets for our, uh, the classroom at uh, St. Francis. And in, in return, we, the St. Francis gives feedback and we test the product. And it, it's a lot of work on both ends. And it's fabulous. The students um, at St. Francis have enjoyed a lot working with the students at the University of Michigan. They've come to uh, the school and met the students and thought, oh my gosh, I, I just met the people that built this. This is great. And it actually is a very exciting thing for both, um, for both groups of people. The, the creators of MyDesk very much want this to be a useful application, so they've done everything they can to that they think would be useful, and then they come into the classroom and we say, oh, did you think of this, and do you think of this, and did you think of this, and it just makes it much, much more of a robust and usable application because it's actually been tried by seventh graders. Mm -hmm. Except, yeah, seventh graders are, are really <laughs> amazing actors. <laughs> They'll push this to the limits, just like we as fish teachers do. They, they push it and they keep on pushing those buttons until, oh my gosh, it doesn't work anymore. Why isn't it working? Fabulous exactly the people we want working on this. So I know we're running close to the end of time, but I just really want to quickly to let you know how to find our app. Um, our app right now is free, and um, you can find it um, by searching on your tablet or um, iPad for IMLC. Um, and on the Android, uh, it has the WeMap, the KWL, WeDraw, and WeWrite. Um, currently on the iPad, it has KWL and Refresh, which is the same as we draw. Um, and there's more coming for the iPad. We're just working. They have a more stringent application process. So these apps are free. Um, if you would like to set up a classroom, a collaborative classroom, uh, contact us, and we'll put you in that classroom setting. Um, and we would love to have more teachers test this in their classroom. Um, Play with it over the summer while you have time. If you have two tablet devices, um, try it out. That's one of the things that Rebecca has. She has two tablets that she works with back and forth just to say, does this work properly? Is it showing up properly? That's a great way. Um, to answer your question, Heather, I, we want this to be free as long, for, forever. So um, we're working on that, and as long as uh, Professor Soloway can make it free to everyone, he's going to make it free. He, his, he keeps on saying, you know, how can we give this away? Um, so we're working on that. So if you want to use this in your classroom in the fall, call me. Um, you, my contact information is on the front first screen, and um, thank you. And it, uh, we'll be able to uh, get you set up. Thank you, Leah, for putting that up. Um, and so, at this time, what questions do you have? <clears throat> Wonder if there's anything else we can add. Um, one of the, uh, one of the things that I wanted to also add that Rebecca did really well in her classroom, <laughs> and she did say she really gave her her classroom, her students really explicit directions every time, you know, giving her, her students to say, you know, this is what you're going to do today, it really helps them a lot and uh, it has really made this product and this, this program really take off. Thank you very much for all of your time and please contact me with any questions you have. If you would, I also have some resources, um, uh, some, these are the, uh, standards, that the student standards and teacher standards, um, some uh, for technology. Um, and if you go to ISTE's site, there's wonderful support if you're looking for training. Um, also, uh, the, the book that Rebecca used is It's About Time for uh, PBIS. You can go to that link and learn more about that. And to learn more about uh, collaboration, Anne-Marie Palancar and Ann Brown from the University of Michigan have written a fantastic uh, paper on this. Um, yes, Rebecca's email as well as on the front of the, you want to tell? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Leah. All right. Well, thank you again for um, all of your wonderful um, attention this evening, and I'm going to hand this off to Leah to wrap things up. 
Thank you so much for attending our session this evening. If you could please give our presenters some feedback at the link and posting in the chat, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and have a great evening.